everyone that the flood of facts surrounding the uh, assassination conspiracies behind uh, Dallas, Memphis, L.A., and Laurel is uh, uh, like a, a storm of, uh, of incomprehensible lightning in the, in the world that we live in. It changes everything. It changes colors of familiar components of the political landscape. It turns political parties that once we thought were strong and forceful and meant something into pawns and uh, manipulated counters on a stage controlled by hidden forces. And the act of government itself is turned most fundamentally into an act of murder. The facts storming at us, sometimes after 10 years with that much delay, ask above all for a new comprehension, a new conception of, uh, of the political world that we live in. The Yankee cowboy theory that I'll try to describe the elements of now is an effort to provide an overarching framework within which it will be possible to understand the ultimate fundamental logic that's being worked out in Dallas and the, and the other sites of major conspiracy over the past uh, 10 or so years. In other words, what we in the ARB are trying to do is to confront the sort of diffuse, pervasive American illusion that things like Dallas happen because there are a few oddballs like Oswald with a completely alternative theory. It doesn't deny accident, the new theory. It doesn't deny crossover and complexity. It doesn't deny ambiguity. And in certain respects, it even demands at least a moment of ambivalence, of, in, of indecision before certain basic questions. The Yankee cowboy theory asks us not to go completely to the end of a certain line of analysis or interpretation in certain respects, notably in respect to the question, who done it, the question of tonight's panel. What we're trying to do is to establish a basic distinction between what we know and what we're beginning to think for the reason that it's around what we know that we can begin to build a political movement in this country although it's around what we think happened in dallas that we have to give perspective and shape to the research and investigation efforts that we undertake what we know is that the orthodox theory is wrong we've been looking at the ocular evidence of that in this uh, souped up version of this of the zapruder film which has been, I can tell you, a, a harrowing uh, experience, even for people long acquainted with the issues and who have seen dozens, if not hundreds of times, the uh, lesser qualities of Pruder film that the AIB has in its possession and has been showing for the past two years. This new thing means that so far as we can make it out, that anybody who looks can see that Kennedy was shot from the front and therefore not by Oswald alone. And looking even further into the bushes, with a computer enhanced, uh, uh, with the computer techniques used in Grodin's film, you're going to even see the, sh the ones pulling the triggers. They are not Oswald. They could not be Os Oswald. They are not where Oswald was. It's around this recognition that the AIB proposes it ought to be possible now for us to generate a mass political demand for a reinvestigation by some means. What the means would be ought to be the occasion of a debate. We don't quite know what would have the right character in the way of a national activity. We don't know what people might be ready for doing. It might be something very simple. It might be something very old-fashioned. Somebody might come up with something new. What we are proposing, though, is that on the minimal question of whether or not we know the basic truth about Dallas, it's now possible and indeed necessary to come to a new consensus. We don't. And we can tell from the way that we don't know, we can tell from how the truth has been kept from us, that it has been kept from us intentionally. And because of the size of the truth and the kind of energy and organizational skill and political weight that we can imagine would have to go into a cover-up of that magnitude to make it succeed against all odds, we have to imagine that the conspiracy cabal is still in place. A difficult and frightening idea. At least we have to imagine that people in high position 
are still disinterested ten years after in looking at the evidence of Wallace and of the assassinations, the Dallas assassination notably, and coming to the indicated conclusion that we have to have a purge of the political system. It needn't be fiery or traumatic, although I don't imagine it could happen without being frightening in something like the same way Watergate was frightening, but it's clear that it would have to happen. It seems to the AIB people, in fact, that a kind of an elemental cleansing of the political apparatus of democracy, the republic of the Constitution itself, is an essential first step. If people in the United States are to have any chance of reasserting the principles of elemental constitutionality of the rule of law and the governance through the normal political mechanisms, unless we're able to reestablish the validity of the institutions by means of which we propose to come to new consensus, propose to undertake policy initiatives, unless we can get, again get some minimal, not puristic, but minimal belief in the durability of the systems and the answerability of people operating through them to the rules of law and to the court of opinion, unless we can establish that kind of power around an issue as central and as clear as the Kennedy assassination, then it does not seem to us that the country stands very good prospect of dealing with mounting uh, menace of world war and depression. Uh, I should add domestic repression too. As Mark Lane was just saying a few minutes ago, we can look at the Zubruder film over and over and over again, dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and see again the brutality of the beast that we face. But what we have to do at some point is decide that if that can be so clear and people can still get away with it, with it, then the powers that could change things are not yet formed, and we have to go about forming those powers. That's what this conference is about. It's around the idea that we don't know what happened and we have to know what happened before we can pretend to be a self-governing country again, before we can pretend to be able to, uh, to face the problems that we face as a national collectivity. Getting to the bottom of what has gone rotten in the state of Denmark means getting to the bottom of the assassination, getting to the bottom of the usurpation of power, the staining of the, of the precious diadem of national sovereignty. These are maybe empty phrases a little bit ago, but seen in view of the theft of Dallas, the theft of sovereignty, the theft of popular will, the theft of our right to make decisions about what our country is to be. This is a theft as powerful as any in history. It confronts us surely with political issues as reverberant as any other single gesture. It gives us our face, it tells us who we are as a people, and it shows us our agenda. If we can deal with that, we maybe could deal with the other things. But if we can't deal with that, then how we'll handle the problem of depression, the threat of war, increased social dislocation, and mounting uh, indications that the right wing thinks it's time for full-scale repression in a police state, goes beyond me. I don't know how we would be able to have the will to handle those incredible problems if we don't have the will to manage the barely beginning to be credible, the barely beginning to be sizable, a problem that we can get in our hands, the problem of the assassination. But now within the decision to undertake that, it's still necessary to speculate. It's always necessary, we think, to divide speculation from fact and not to assert as factual what is only reconstructive, what is hypothetical. Nevertheless, it's still necessary to, to hypothesize, to think about these things. It's necessary, in a sense, not to be intimidated by that kind of the reverse English of the fear of paranoia. It's necessary to be able to say things like Mark said last night when he said the President of the United States is an accomplice in Dallas. That gives our imaginations and our insight the stretch that they need to encompass this problem. It's, but it all, it's also a speculation of a kind. We don't know quite in what sense he meant it, how metaphorical or how exact he meant it. It could be, of course, one day one and the next day the next. But within the possibilities, there's a center of meaning. And it's towards that center of meaning that we go in the demand for politicizing the issue and, and then in the effort as we do that to attempt to reconstruct what may have been happening in Dallas. Now, that's where the Yankee cowboy theory comes in. It's an attempt to reconstruct the, the general shapes of the forces in play at that time. The theory is by itself very simple. There's almost nothing to it, and certainly there are no new facts. Uh, 
I don't come armed with uh, uh, barrages of facts like uh, the other investigators. I'm not working at that level. Uh, or I shouldn't say level. I'm not working at that side of the thing. Other people, and this is very necessary, you've seen how necessary it is, involve themselves like sleuths in the sleuthic problems, trying to determine who killed Kennedy, like any uh, Dashiell Hammett character, maybe, trying to figure out who committed the crime. And you've seen the astonishing amount of evidence that people have about that. But now there's another end to the question. Why was the crime committed? How does it fit if it was indeed a high-level conspiracy into the overall flow of American uh, politics during that period? Without trying to put in any of the historical apparatus, which would just make this thing way too cumbersome, let me just uh, start this, this little piece of the thing by trying to characterize the mentalities that I'm thinking of and the, and the general power bases when I, I offer these terms Yankee and Cowboy as, as rubrics for discussion of what's happening to us. By Yankee, I'm, I'm trying to indicate, as would I guess be obvious enough from the word itself, the, uh, the Eastern establishment, multinational, monopoly capitalist formations that uh, are personified in the person or the empire of the Rockefellers. David Rockefeller is, from this standpoint, the uh, archetypal Yankee. Uh, the perspective of the Yankee is uh, complex and tortured and, pro and constantly in process of reformation, and I don't like having to do so much damage to its actual complexity, but I think it may be possible and fair, may be fair to produce the following kind of generalization. The Yankee stands on the East Coast and relates to Europe as to the opposite side of a lake which exists as a medium for communication and transportation. The Yankee worldview, uh, Anglophilic, and rooted in the, in the belief that there is a special relationship between the, the United States and Britain, imagines that the center of the world is the North Atlantic industrial community that came into being roughly in this century and that has been traumatized and molded in several world wars. That world center, at least from the standpoint of itself, is, uh, is historically, traditionally, currently, the domain of interest of, of the Yankee sensibility and the multinational corporation, which moves throughout this as through its capital sphere, is the primary mode of economic organization of this class. The monopoly capitalist class has several characteristics which differentiate itself, which differentiate it from another class, the class of modern cowboy entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurial capitalism, cowboy capitalism, is the capitalism that grew up in the United States, particularly because the United States happened to grow up with a frontier that was constantly in motion. When Marx analyzed the 19th century societies and derived the basic conceptions of class that Marxists today still employ, he was operating with countries that basically had finished boundaries, top, bottom, left, and right. That was, of course, not true in detail. There were plenty of boundary altercations in that period and beyond, and there remain plenty of boundary altercations in contemporary European affairs, very important. But the boundary altercations that existed existed for all. What was distinctive about the United States was that it had a boundary that no one else shared. It had a boundary that went beyond Western civilization itself, a boundary on some outside world which the white man conqueror of the Western tradition moving across the Atlantic to this country in a period of exploration and colonization saw as his without question, his to dominate, his to exploit, his to make his own in, in ever deeper and some would say more horrifying ways, as the whole spectacle of industrial civilization rolls over that mythic Indian past, which begins to seem so, to so many of us these days an infinitely preferable alternative. In any case, the movement of the frontier throughout the whole history of the United States meant that there was always an escape hatch, so to speak, there was always a way to avoid coming to conflict in the big cities over the issues that were therefore constantly suspended. There was always enough to go around 
so that the, uh, the, social, the normal social adversaries that normally would be in conflict with one another, sharply as in Europe, producing today a viable socialist tradition, in this country turned to the West. All kinds of people went to the West, not just cowboys. Frontier Democrats are as important in this country's history, and so is populism as the cowboy strain that I'm identifying in my particular use of the term today. But the cowboy is a figure that emerges in the West in the wake of the Civil War and the Reconstruction period. When the Yankees able to reestablish, when the Yankees really able to establish for the first time their leadership over the federal executive as a result of the Civil War, ultimately were able to reincorporate the cow, what was becoming the cowboy base the old slave base, the old base of the slave South, the Bourbonage, the, the, the guys who owned the slaves and got beat in the war and, and now didn't run the government anymore. They went on the other side of the Mississippi. They took fortunes with them as they were able to save them. It wasn't all just gone with the wind. A lot of people were able to move. A whole milieu began to begins to reconstitute itself in the 70s, 80s, the 90s. It's a point of research. It's something that needs to be gone into. I think there's an argument to be made for the view that the Confederacy forces actually begin to make a comeback at the expense of Reconstruction forces when the great Yankees, who had come into power as a result of the Civil War, to push their program of national industrialization, decided that they need to reconstitute some kind of military establishment to beat the Indians in the, in, in the West. The, the Southern power begins to reestablish its, its hold over military institutions in the wars that followed the closing of the Reconstruction period and the dismantling of the reforms instituted by the abolitionists. I think it would be a mistake for me to try to tell the whole story of the United States in, 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 in such simple terms. But the Civil War is, is, a, is a kind of an important point for a moment for us to think about, if only because we might be in the threshold of, of another one. It seems in any case that the issues are, are somewhat similar. We know that the country in the beginning was ruled by a southern power establishment, an elite centered in Virginia. And we know that, that what this elite was basically interested in doing was supplying the kind of things that a colony supplies to a mother country. And in return, it got back from England the kind of things that a rich colonial elite is accustomed to getting back from other, a mother country. Raw materials went over, cotton, and what came back was the fruit of the British Industrial Revolution. That was consumed by the Southern gentry. In spite of their power, forces of industrialism were doomed to prevail. And finally, by the 1840s or the 50s, the rule of the Southern elite was being challenged by emerging Northern industrial interests which wanted the tariffs to go higher against British industrial goods so that American industry would have a chance to protect itself and to get going. The Southerners didn't want that to happen, and so the dispute got very sharp. It was expressed in a number of ways, finally, as the Civil War. In the Civil War, Lincoln not only maintains the integrity of the Union, he also asserts over the Union the hegemony of the federal government. There is to be one United States of America. It is to be run from one central federated government. There is not to be a confederacy. There is not to be concession, there is secession. There is not to be the, what we might now call the balkanization of the, of the North American continent and some idea of equal citizen rights projected into that scene by the abolitionists. Subsequently becomes, for those of us who follow along to be mystified, the whole meaning of the Civil War. So that most of us today, if we have any ideas, or that the casual opinion, I should say, the casual and ordinary opinion of the Civil War is that it was fought to free the slaves and bring about social equity. There was some of that. The abolitionists wanted that to happen. A lot of others did, and they fought for it. But we would have to say, looking at the consequences and the overall turn of that machinery, that the real base dynamic that brought the Civil War situation about, the clash, the confrontation, and the victory of the North, was the emergence of forces of industrial power in the North and their need to go beyond the kind of program that Southern slave agrarianism was committed to. And now I'm saying, as a part of the historical reconstruction, that the power defeated, the Southern Confederate power defeated in the Civil War and held down for a couple of decades when the abolitionists tried to do good things in the South in very trying circumstances. That power finally became necessary again to the Harrimans of the Union Pacific who needed land and freedom and security for moving the railroads across the continent. 
And it was in that task that Southern Confederate-style militarism began to be reconstituted as a subgroup, a, a smaller power group within the overall constellation of power groups shaping American policy. My argument in brief to make several very quick steps in and to move rapidly toward the future is that the coalition thus formed between Yankee and Cowboy, with Yankee in the senior position and Cowboy in the junior position, began to change from the inside out as a result of World War II and the Cold War. World War II projected enormous energy into the Cowboy military defense sphere. The Cold War projected the same kind of energy into the national security establishment, both operating in militaristic, authoritarian, secretive ways, found it, as we see all too clearly from today's headlines, all too possible to establish themselves within a clandestine sector of government that not many of us knew, it, knew existed, and that seems to have in fact been making the major policy decisions of the period. Let's come with this idea of Yankee and Cowboy to the administration of, of John Kennedy. But let's take a little step into the future of Watergate, because it's in Watergate that I think we begin to see very clearly what Kennedy's death was all about. The tapes that you remember did Nixon in, the, the June 23rd, 1972 tapes of, of his conversations with Haldeman, were fastened on for the language in which we finally at last see Nixon explicitly and without any doubt saying, all right, cover it up, do anything, get it, get it off, uh, get it away, do it in. Up till then, Nixon had been saying, of course, that he hadn't really wanted that to happen. He wanted the truth to come out. But there we heard it, we saw it on a page, and there was no way to doubt it anymore. And a little bit thereafter, Nixon resigned, and then we had Ford, and then Ford closing the book on Watergate. Because the book on Watergate has been effectively closed in the national media, the real question of the June 23rd tapes has never even been gone into. Here and there in the Sunday supplement, there will be an article maybe raising some of the questions but there has been no highly energized, deeply motivated, public inquiry into the substance of Nixon's fear, into the motive that made it impossible for him to imagine coming clean, that made it clear to him from the beginning that he would have to cover up Watergate. The question is, is posed in four passages in the June 23rd tapes. In very dramatic ways. I just want to read you Nixon's language just to, to refresh your sense of the, the atmosphere. He says in the 10 a.m. meeting that day to Haldeman, of course this hunt, that will uncover a lot of things. You open that scab, there's a hell of a lot of things. And we just feel that it would be very detrimental to have this thing go any further. This involves these Cubans hunt and a lot of hanky-panky that we have nothing to do with ourselves. Later in that same dialogue, Nixon again says to Haldeman, when you get in, when you get in unintelligible people, say, look, the problem is that this will open the whole, the, the whole Bay of Pigs thing, and the president just feels that, ah, oh, without going into the details, don't, don't lie to them to the extent to say there is no involvement, but just say this is a comedy of errors without getting into it. The president believes that it is going to open the whole Bay of Pigs thing up again. And uh, because these people are plugging for unintelligible and that they should call the FBI in and unintelligible, don't go any further in this case, period. 1 p.m. Nixon to Haldeman again. Okay, just postpone unintell unintelligible. Just say unintelligible. Very bad to have this fellow hunt. Uh, he knows too damn much if he was involved. You happen to know that? If it gets out that this is all involved, the Cuba thing would be a fiasco. It's an incredible piece of language. The Cuba thing would be a fiasco. The Cuba fiasco, of course, is in the name of the Bay of Pigs invasion. It would make the CIA look bad. It's going to make Hunt look bad. And it is likely to blow the whole Bay of Pigs thing, which we think would be very unfortunate, both for the FBI and for the country at this time and for American foreign policy, just tell him to lay off. <coughs> Finally, the 220 meeting that day, Haldeman says, Gray, then head of the FBI, called Helms, CIA, 
and said, I think we've run right into the middle of a CAI covert, CIA covert operation. Nixon says, Gray said that? Haldeman says, yeah. And Unintelligible said, nothing we've done at this point. And uh, Unintelligible says, well, it sure looks to me like it is unintelligible. And uh, <laughs> those things happen. And, and that was the end of that. <laughs> unintelligible. Here, here we go. The problem is, it tracks back to the Bay of Pigs. This is Haldeman. And it tracks back to some other, the leads run out to people who had no involvement in this except by contracts and connections. But it gets to areas that are liable to be realized. The whole problem, unintelligible, hunt. So at that point, he kind of got the picture. This is Haldeman rounding it out. He said, he said, we'll be very happy to be helpful unintelligible. Handle anything you want. So those guys were scared too of whatever scared Nixon. Everybody would go along if the whole Bay of Pigs thing came out. Well, our question then is, what could the whole Bay of Pigs thing be? Uh, I think that we probably have to start it with uh, the anniversary before it happened. The, the date that the Bay of Pigs would be invaded on in 1961. Rather, it's two years before, 1959. April 19, 1959, Castro came to the United States, had a big reception, and, uh, and he had a talk with Nixon. Nixon decided, as he later wrote in some uh, Reader's Digest pieces, <laughs> that uh, Castro was a communist and that that wouldn't do. The reason why Castro wouldn't do ultimately was clarified. Uh, it had to do with the issue of the, Lansky, of the Lansky casinos that were being run in Havana. And, and this is a place where we hit a sort of a, a side, an important side spur coming in. And it's Nixon's Cuba past. Maybe that's really where the whole bad pigs thing starts. Jeff Gerth, uh, whom some of you will have heard, has, I think, made a very powerful argument. Uh, to the effect that Nixon is a syndicate man from the beginning, if I understand Girth right. That in 1943 already, when Nixon is starting out in politics, he starts out a, a syndicate person in direct connection with syndicate people in, in Rebozo, operating a, a, a tire, a black market tire business uh, out of uh, the Caribbean. Uh, Rebozo got rich and, and powerful by running the, uh, the gas station that was the main outlet state side of the black market tires. Nixon was at that period in the Office of Price Administration. It was his first job, I think, out of Duke. Maybe he had had one job before. His particular desk was responsible for the black market business in the Southeast. So all correspondence having to do with any litigations around black marketeering in, in rubber tire, in tires would come to Nixon. And that is how, Gerth argues, that is how Nixon got to know that whole Miami uh, Cuba bunch, starting out with George Smathers, who was at that period a lawyer uh, for one of the Lansky front companies involved in uh, running the tires in from, from Cuba. Uh, Smathers wrote a letter in behalf of his client to the uh, OPA and it got to Nixon and Nixon got back to him and pretty soon Rebozo was in the picture and there it was. He went off to the Navy to begin his make, making his credentials look right, I suppose, and then went to that other bastion of organized crime, Southern California, in the years right after the war and began to grow horns as a very heavy political heavy immediately. Well, so we think that there is a specific syndicate connection in, in Nixon's background and that he will turn out, in fact, to have been in some important respect the syndicate's president. So we remember when we look at this whole Bay of Pigs thing that what Nixon probably discovers from Castro in that important meeting in 1959 is that the, the Lansky casino system is not really going to be allowed to operate, that the Lansky base in Havana is going to be dissolved. Now, that was a very important base, not just because Nixon was linked into it. I don't want to go into that now because that involves sketching out the world structure of, of, uh, of organized crime. But let's just keep it as a, as a memo that uh, there's a whole history to the syndicate's involvement in, in, uh, in the developing of Cuba as a, as a secure offshore stronghold stronghold of the, of the mafia and other kinds of organized criminal forces that come together under Lansky's corporate leadership, Rockefeller-style leadership, as what we now call the National Crime Syndicate. 
The syndicate liked Cuba a lot. Lansky liked Batista a great deal. They were close friends, and a lot of money was generated out of that friendship. And when Castro came and closed it down, a lot of very uh, hostile kinds of people got angry. When Nixon knew for a fact that that system was going to be thrown over by Castro, then it was for a fact, in his view, that Castro was going to be himself thrown out. Nixon was at that time a member of an NS, uh, National Security Agency group, the 5412-2 group, or the special group, which had the, uh, an elite group at the top of the power structure, which has basically the effect of approving everything that the country actually does that's serious. This group, uh, on which Eisenhower was not represented, except through Nixon, on the basis of uh, reconstructions at the time and, and afterwards, appears to have made the decision, independent of Eisenhower, that Castro would have to be got rid of. And so uh, the organization began for the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. It, would be, it began after April 1959. Eisenhower later said he didn't know about it. People say there's reason to believe him. Eisenhower said, I thought that what they were doing was figuring out how to put a few little guerrilla groups in the Sierra to act like Castro going backwards. But what they were actually thinking about was putting a whole big landing thing at the, at the Bay of Pigs, supported by B-26s coming from Central America, very well modernized, to, to give aerial support to the beachhead invasion and to suppress the uh, Cuban Revolution's embryonic air force, and then supported in another way by an assassination of, uh, of Castro himself. The, th the theory of that was that the, the government was too tenuous uh, uh, to withstand the loss of a great leader, that the factions would spring apart, start fighting with one another, that the revolution would come discombobulated, and in the resulting chaos it would be possible for counter-revolution to find opportunities. That's what they were looking for because they wanted to get rid of all that stuff. But Kennedy came in and he said, in effect, if you do this kind of thing to Cuba, then how in the world are the people in Latin America ever going to believe that they have a hope, that they have a future in any kind of relationship with the United States? Isn't that going to give fuel to the communists who are attacking us all over the place in, in, the, in South America? So there was an argument about what was the best thing to do. Kennedy seems to have come upon this program. It seems that this program took him by surprise. He hadn't expected it when he called to get tough on Cuba during the campaign. He seemed to have enjoyed outflanking Nixon on the right. But when he came to office and confronted this invasion project, which he had not apparently been briefed on, he didn't know what to do. I would suppose he was too weak. I would suppose he didn't yet know his way in April of 1961, March of April, a few months after being inaugurated in, uh, in Washington. He didn't know his way around the government yet. In any case, what he had arrayed against him was an invasion program in being. Fletcher Prouty of the Defense Intelligence Agency says during the time Kennedy won the election and the time he got inaugurated, a little 33-man project inside the Defense Department got magically escalated into a 3,300-man project by the simple expedient of adding two zeros to all the personnel records. This was part of the project that Prouty says was presented to Kennedy as though it were an in-being project that had been checked off at all the important levels of government and that Kennedy would be a bad man not to go along with. Nevertheless, from some resources that I don't think we know enough about his administration to identify now, he and Robert Kennedy were able to amount some kind of resistance to the invasion program to the extent that Kennedy was able to say there will be no B-26s flying from Central America and there will be no assassination of Castro. Because the B-26s didn't fly, argues Howard Hunt in his reconstruction of the events, as do all the veterans of the Bay of Pigs, because the B-26s didn't fly, Castro's little air force survived the first hit, and therefore it was able to attack the, uh, the invaders, and therefore they couldn't establish a beachhead, and Castro wasn't assassinated, and therefore the government held together and didn't fractionate and fall apart. And it was not possible for the free Cuba forces to present themselves in the great Western world as the legitimate successors to a spoiled revolution. All those things didn't happen. The Bay of Pigs invasion failed. And American politics then embarked upon a decade of the bitterest kind of acrimony and internal infighting over the most fundamental kinds of questions, all springing from the fiasco of the Bay of Pigs, where a Yankee force, imagining that it belongs to America to present some kind of progressive and liberal image to hold out some hope in the free world empire of reform through patience, confronts a cowboy not so sophisticated about imperialism but very sophisticated about military needs, 
not so interested in Europe, but very interested in seeing the frontier so basic to this to that cowboy perception of the world continue to unfold into the Orient, these two forces suddenly confront one another within the presidency, within the federal executive, and we are suffering today from the reverberations of that battle. Today, Watergate, as we see, as we're beginning to see. So Kennedy was able, was, because he was president, was strong enough to stop the invasion, not to stop the invasion, but strong enough to keep it from being big enough to succeed. The other side, the cowboy side, was strong enough to make the invasion happen in spite of the fact that Kennedy didn't seem to want it to, but not strong enough to push it so hard that it could go right through to victory. That was may <clears throat> maybe just the, it was certainly just the beginning of, the, of Kennedy's crimes against cowboy sensibilities and political interests. Uh, I should make an observation at this point. Often people ask me how since I used to attack liberals, do I now seem to defend Kennedy and his program? I think that's a very legitimate question, and I must confess I find it a little bit hard to answer because I think the categories are kind of puzzling. I don't know. Let me just say now for the, for the record, and if anybody wants to come back to it, it's okay. I'll try to be better later. But now, even if... Let's say that I was wrong when I said before that all liberals are the same. Let's say that on the basis of information that we've begun to recover since 1965, we begin to put a new picture together of what government is actually like. We no longer tend to see the president, for example, as a monarch with complete power over bureaucracy, unbendingly loyal to him, no matter who he is. We see the president as something more like the president of a big company. He has the same kind of problems, the president of the United States, that the president of a big company would have. There are problems of internal factionating. There are problems of coordinating the various parts of the bureaucracies. There are problems of keeping the party together. All these problems visit the head of the corporation, and they alike visit the head of the ex chief executive of the corporate state. If we understand the president as, an exe as a corporate executive, subject to pressures, violent pressures on his office, then the presidency begins to clarify for us. It's not just the unrolling of a policy duel between the presidency and the legislative branches. It's the unrolling of a duel within the presidency itself for the, uh, for, for the power to stipulate policy, for the power to give definition to national energy, for the power to generate a sense of movement and program. The struggle around the powers of the presidency is the definitive struggle of the 60s and so far into the 70s. Kennedy, as, as I was arguing, in this position of constant drama and heightened shadows, falls further afoul his foes in a series of, of blistering radical moves that I think ought to establish him as the, as the leading new leftist. Not that he knew what he was about, not that he had a theoretical reconstruction of what was good, not that he was not a terrible elitist, not that he wasn't dependent totally on the peculiar kinds of power nourished in the Yankee establishment uh, dominions, but that he had an instinct that, that, that American foreign policy was somehow at a position coming into the 60s where it needed to make an important new departure. Specifically, there had to be some kind of change in the Cold War because if its logic kept unrolling that way, sure in anything, there'd be nuclear confrontation soon. Therefore, the logic of disarmament and the salt talk. There had to be some new kind of policy toward Latin America. Otherwise, the dispossessed and the wretched of that part of the earth, abandoning hope in the American system, would surely turn against us. Kennedy could tell that. It wasn't so much as a partisan of the dispossessed as someone trying to lead a system into rationality and coherence and durability that Kennedy moved as a monopoly capitalist with an Atlantic outlook to produce that kind of world that Woodrow Wilson wanted, a world where the industrial powers were concerted together, making world policy among themselves, supplying a tithe so that the colonial countries could uh, develop in some second-class or third-class way, but presiding over everything by the force of combined military might so that even if they did have to be momentarily unjust, it wouldn't make any difference, they couldn't be overthrown. That with Wilsonian view of world order essentially inhabits the New Deal and it inhabits the New Frontier. Kennedy was in pursuit of it, and in pursuit of that kind of order, that Camelot, that Camelot vision of world happiness, a frontier Camelot, 
he tried to affect that old Roosevelt-style synthesis between North and South, new and old, industrial and agricultural, Yankee and cowboy, was able to do so to the extent of getting the leading cowboy on the ticket with him, but then seemed catapulted immediately into a, situ into a situation where his least demand, where his, where his least independence in the use of his office's powers led him into a confrontation that he couldn't possibly win. That confrontation speeded up over the years. 62, what happened in 62? A number of things. He got into a big fight with, uh, with steel industry and began to isolate uh, some of his Yankee help in that respect because the steel industry is a big part of the banking industry and the banking industry is mainly what the Yankees are all about. Madame Gandhi pointed out at a, certain, at a certain point after the assassination that he died, Kennedy did, because he lost the support of his peers. He lost the support of the other Yankees. And, and the whole episode in 62 around the, the steel price rise uh, was an important moment in that process of loss, process of the loss of consensus, the loss of the base, Kennedy being pushed more and more into private conversations with his brother as the, as the new frontier worked on towards the tragic uh, denouement. Probably the American University speech in 1963 calling for an end to the Cold War, a movement toward Entente with the Soviet Union was another big blow against Kennedy in the eyes of the cowboys, but surely the topper must have been if it was in 1963 that the assassination conspiracy was hatched. Then the topper may have been Kennedy's attack on the oil depletion allowance system. Uh, you know that's an enormously complicated system by means of which the oil People get very wealthy at the expense of the rest of us. And, uh, and before there's going to be any kind of real political change in this country, that system at least has to be attacked and, and overthrown. If we don't have to nationalize the whole oil industry, which is probably where it's going to come to. But even failing that, there's a lot of sympathy. Uh, but never mind talk of, of nationalization. Simple talk of, uh, of doing something about oil depletion allowances was enough to get the dander up of the... Of, a lot of types interested in, um, in, the way, in keeping things the way they were. But probably the big push was Vietnam. Kennedy, as he is accused of Cuba, of the Cuban invasion, is also accused by basic historic texts of starting out the Vietnam War. I think that if we try to move in closer and look at the, at the divisions within the corporate Kennedy presidency, the split and enfevered presidency, we'll, we'll find a picture that's very like that of the Cuban situation. A cowboy force moves to define a national interest in a particular theater and employs military and or clandestine means to pursue that interest. The Yankee force, rubbing his, its eyes, trying to come awake from something of the Cold War, some part of the Cold War, begins to specify other national interests that are contradicted by the investment of energy into Vietnam and so on. Wants to draw lines, wants to make the commitment to maintaining the open frontier in the Orient wants to make a limit to the commitment to do that. In other words, an Atlanticist like Kennedy would ask of any Vietnam policy how it redounded on European-American relations. And if it were good in itself but adversely affected those relations, that might be grounds itself for not following that policy. That is the, the heart and the essence of the Yankee perspective, that it sees America linked to West Europe, to the Western democracies, and above all, fights to preserve those relationships. Now, if those relationships are impeached by some definition of national objectives requiring us to invest inordinate amounts of our available national productive energy in other theaters and in other kinds of crusades, then America is in fundamental trouble even if she is able to win a power position in Southeast Asia. So the criticism that began to develop in the ruling classes about the war in Vietnam began to develop around a consciousness of what frustration in that war was doing to the privileged relationships and what persistence in frustration was doing in a way of producing internal social dislocation. Kennedy nevertheless was a cold warrior and he had some responsibility to his own right wing, to the right wing of the Yankee establishment, not to go too far or to try to explain himself as to what he wanted. He thought maybe a little investment of clandestinism could do, coupled with some nation building. He sent the first 16,000 so-called advisors over, and in that respect, from a technical standpoint, as well as a political standpoint, started the flow.
started the flow that culminated in the incredible Johnson escalations and the Nixon secret air war. But the interesting thing about those 16,000 those 16, is that they seem to have been sent with, a, with return trip tickets, unlike the others. In other words, there were preconditions set on their commitment to the area. Just as Kennedy seems to have been saying in Cuba, if the victory could be achieved without the B-26s and the assassination, well, I can't stop you from trying it. He says in Vietnam, if South Vietnam can be preserved in the free world by the investment of a lot of technical and military aid and a few thousand advisors, all right, I'm not strong enough to keep you from doing it. In any case, the whole issue may have had to have been bartered in the context of the whole emerging power struggle between Nixon or Kennedy and his enemies. In any case, in September of 1963, Kennedy is saying at press conferences that it's their war, American boys can't be expected to do that, there's limits to what we're going to spend. In October, he says, all right, we're going to bring the first thousand troops back. The reports coming from McNamara and the others are that, wow, we've almost won, it'll be just a minute. Uh, Senator Aiken's pro program may have been about to have been implemented. Remember, Aiken said the way to handle the war thing is to say, we've won it and we're coming home, we'll have the victory celebration. <laughs> Kennedy, in effect, was saying that it's cost conditional, this commitment, now is the time to come home. The Pentagon didn't like that, and so Kennedy made the Pentagon say that it was going along. On, in October, Pentagon, a Pentagon general appeared on the steps of the White House or someplace, and he made a public announcement to the effect that there were going to be 1,000 troop withdrawals in December. But the big barrier to a peace in Vietnam on that basis was, would have been the Diem family, do you remember? The Diem family badly did not want to make any kind of peace with communists. Madam, I'm saying Diem, am I not? Madam Diem uh, corrected that impression later. I don't know about that. She says, yes, they were, and it was some bad people that wiped them out, that the Diem family would have negotiated with the Viet Cong. But until we get that straight, we have to assume that that was a barrier, and that must have had something to do with the removal of the Diem family on November 1st, of 1963. Out of a Bangkok exile, pre-groomed for just this role, came the regime of General uh, uh, Min, uh, Big Men. And the distinctive thing about Big Men, <clears throat> as a Time Magazine cover story told us, very, it was printed right away in the middle, middle of November. It was the issue out, I think, when Kennedy was killed. The thing about Min was that he wasn't afraid of negotiating with the NLF. So he, came, he was coming into power on a specific program of trying to negotiate some kind of uh, new relationship with the, with the Viet Cong. The Vietnam War, for one little moment, was about not to take place, at least not to take place in the form in which it happened. Then there was uh, Dallas. The day after Dallas, Johnson signed uh, National Security Agency Memorandum uh, 278, a classified document, which people who have seen it say, reverses the Kennedy policy of de-escalation and secretly and officially installs the Johnson policy of big strategic war to maintain the American position in Vietnam. Now, Johnson had to win the election. He kept it down. He kept it quiet. He came off as the peace candidate in the uh, uh, 64 elections against Goldwater, uh, just another cowboy. It says something about the power of assassination. When you hit the right guy, you take over the whole apparatus at once. You have the Democratic Party, you have the Republican Party. You can stage the whole thing. If you want a warrior to come across as a peacenik, you put a worse warrior against him, and you make him look good. A technique uh, basic to Nixon's political history, by the way, from the very beginning. Well, there is where we find the liberal failure at that point, in those middle years. But let's not go into that. There's where the liberal failure is, I think. The failure of the liberals to come to accounts with the indications of Dallas and to let the cover story go by without trying to fight it. That seems to me the real shame of liberalism in that period. And being shamefaced, how could liberalism fight the, against the coming of the war in Vietnam? Committed to the crazy idea that Johnson was just Kennedy, only better because he also was right wing as well as left wing. The liberals just went along with the great society pap not understanding that all Johnson was doing domestically in this uh, highly touted program of social reform was just extending the suffrage system available to his party, actually gutting what little there was of the welfare state, not building it out, just holding the idea of welfareism up to ridicule, holding the very idea of social progress up to shame. 
If that's what progress was, Johnson, if that's what a liberal program was, the Great Society, it was shameful. But the liberals were going along with it. They weren't raising questions in those days. They're not even raising very many today, but it was worse then. That doesn't mean, though, I think that it doesn't mean that the, pa that the power struggle ended. I would like just to, to skirt, if I can, some of the, well, just move real fast up towards Watergate through what's left of the 60s. I'll say, well, I think that what had happened with the, with the Yankees was that they decided sometime by 67 or 68 that Johnson was off the wall and that he would have to be removed. Certainly, after the Tet Offensive, a number of people seem to have come to that conclusion. But I think even before the Tet Offensive hit in February, there are, also sign, there, there are signs of very vigorous motion around Johnson's administration and within it of people who we can easily identify as heavy gunslingers for the Yankee establishment, the kind of big boys that are sent when the, when the big guys want action. I mean, people like Clark Clifford, George Ball, Averill Harriman, Cyrus Vance, all these deep-seated Yankees, bone-bred to that tradition, show up in the Johnson administration uh, towards its end, in, uh, in 1967, they're already in positions scattered in the administration doing various things. And then comes Tet, and then comes that incredible March, end of March abdication, which had the effect of starting the peace talks out, stopping the air war over the North, and uh, opening up the democratic process to Bobby Kennedy's presidential campaign. We know that in the immediate aftermath of Johnson's abdication, Martin Luther King fell victim to whatever new battle that push had inaugurated, and that uh, a couple of months later, uh, defying the message implicit in, in that shooting in Memphis, Bobby Kennedy fell too. And that evident underlying popular feeling that the country once again needed to ease off, to liberalize, to slow down, to cool it, to stop making war, again evaporated, again had no way to focus itself. Just as in 1964, all the people wanted peace. They had no way to say it through the system, having to choose between Johnson and Goldwater. So because of the assassination of the implicit presidential figures of 1968, King and Kennedy, who represented the true social coalition that was coming into power, the assassination, assassination of those figures meant there was no longer any way for those forces to express themselves in the arena of presidential politics, and so fell by the way, and again, people who wanted peace, who wanted some kind of rational, reasonable program of domestic reform, were confronted as, instead with a choice between a right-wing guy and a guy who was a little more right-wing, Humphrey and Nixon. Both of them uh, very friendly to the industrial military types, very willing to make whatever concessions had to be made in order to keep the internal power coalition happy. So in this rapid interplay of stroke and counterstroke, just to sum up, we see cowboys moving against, well, Yankees move against the cowboys in 1960, when Kennedy steals the election, apparently, or so the Nixonians still believe, by virtue of hanky-panky carried out by Daley in Chicago and the Johnson political machine in Texas. I mean, the Nixon people come into the 60s believing that they had actually won the election and that they had been screwed and that Kennedy's political power had been what screwed him. That maybe made him feel a little better a little later on when, when they turned it all around. We have that first act of theft, of Yankee theft, of Yankee pilferage within the electoral system. Then we have the gunplay of Dallas, a response to tensions building up over the next two and a half years. Then that period from 64 to 67 or 68, when people are fooled, when the man who is making war says he is making peace and gets away with it. The man who says he is making social progress actually introduces reactionary social policies and gets away with it, with the liberals cheering. But beginning in 67 and 68, to develop a consciousness that what was happening was wrong and putting into play, as I would theorize, a power move that brought about the effect of getting Johnson out of the way and opening up the process for a new burst of Kennedyism, a new burst of Kennedy reformism. That then in turn got stopped by the cowboy counterplay, the gunplay of Memphis and Los Angeles. And we were on our way into Nixon's time. 
We people who wanted peace, we were on our way into the uh, secret air war now because he was too ashamed to let us know what he was doing. He knew that we didn't want him to do it. But he was full of it. He was willful. He had it on his mind that it had to be done and nobody was going to tell him anything else. And he did it. And as all his people were glad they were doing it. They only wished they could be doing it bigger and better. They wanted the war. The liberals tell us now that we drifted into it, that it was by blunder and accident and not realizing what we were doing. Halberstam's book, The Best and the Brightest, makes that argument. It's a valuable book, but that's what it argues, and it seems to me wrong. The liberals drifted. The liberals didn't understand. They didn't see who Johnson was. They couldn't tell a war policy from a peace policy when they could hear the bombs. But the, we got into the war not because of that drift, but because there was another organized party that militantly wanted the war to take place, that felt the war had to happen or the country was sunk. Look, we had lost China, had we not, to the uh, revolution. That happened in 1950. Then came the Korean War. We tried to fight out the issues in the Korean War. The Yankees uh, limited the cowboy investment once again, tried to develop this crazy idea of a limited uh, fight. And so the cowboys would say, that made it all the worse. China bad, China plus uh, the Korean War is still worse. Now we come to Vietnam. How many times is this issue going to have to be fought out in the East? How many times is the United States going to have to go out with her cruisers, her fleet, her soldiers, her, her aircraft, and say to the world, we are moving west because that's the American way. That's the cowboy image that the frontier that started this country has to continue it, otherwise the country is going to have to change in fundamental ways inside. There even seems to be a sense these days that the issue is precisely the closing of the American frontier. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's not the right wing that gets that faster than the left wing does, because the left wing traditionally orients to a European world standpoint. And the right wing traditionally orients to a frontierist anti-European standpoint that sees America as poisoned by continued relationships, entanglements in Europe, that sees America as liberated, as a, as a land where democracy and capitalism happily coexist, only on the condition that this frontier keeps moving, that we keep expanding, expanding the world space available to our enterprise, available to the entrepreneur, like Howard Hughes like H.L. Hunt, like, like Getty, like all these southwestern moguls, the entrepreneurial capitalists, much more wealthy indiv as individuals than the Yankee counterparts, uh, but commanding nothing like the, the empires of Yankee scope. Howard Hughes, for example, people say is worth three or four billion dollars compared to that. David Rockefeller is, is piker. A few hundred million is all he's worth. But the empire that Hughes sits on ends with him, with that four billion. The empire that David Rockefeller sits on goes to 400 billion, maybe, who knows really. But at least in this kind of stepwise disparity of relationships, we can get a sense of the, of the interstices in which the cowboy Yankee gunplay or conflict takes place. We have an individual cowboy like Hughes with enormous personal leverage up against a highly institutionalized power center like the Rockefeller, in which individuals don't have that much room for maneuver, the whole, except, and, and the main job of captaincy is to keep the whole vast link-up of institutions moving together in some rational way. Hughes, for example, doesn't have that problem. He's an entrepreneur, not a monopolist. The frontier made it possible for entrepreneurs to get rich to the tune of $4 billion because the frontier space constantly recreated the situation in which entrepreneurial styles of individual initiative capitalism flourish. Following behind were the railroads, the Harrimans, the Yankees. They would come after and assimilate these small personal empires into larger empires, would provide modern style rationalization, technological, administrative, and the rest. The cowboys would keep moving away from them, out into new, clear wilderness, out into land that nobody lives in, because the Indians aren't people. The Hawaiians aren't people at a certain point. The Filipinos aren't people at another point. At another point, the Chinese aren't, and then come the turn of the Koreans not to be people, and the Vietnamese not to be people. These reds are like the redskins of the old days. They perform the same service. They bow down to our genocidal needs. They give us uh, space, and, and they give us also the sense of righteousness, of using opportunities made for us, manifest as our destiny in all kinds of signs, but now that very process, whatever one is to make of it, was coming in for fundamental challenge in the victory of the Chinese Revolution, which closes, is probably the real meaning of this century, closes the door once and for all on the movement of Western culture 
into dominant relationships over Eastern cultures. That is really what's behind Korea. Our effort in the Korean War was to keep that door open somehow by maintaining a place. We could outweigh the Chinese monstrosity. Then that failed. It broke out in Vietnam. We had to fight it all over again. How many times would it have to be fought? How many exasperations would a cowboy mind have to endure? The bombings were visited upon Southeast Asia, not out of some awful, impenetrable psychological problem that Nixon had. Those bombings were carried out because of the the political configuration at the moment as the people who ran the country saw it. They moved to fight the war because they wanted it, not because they drifted or stumbled. The cowboys wanted the war because they believed that without America's maintaining her position, that kind of position on an, an open door world east, then the traditional ways were all going to have to be changed. And maybe they were right. Maybe when that frontier closes, the traditional ways are going to have to be changed, and maybe that's precisely the kind of, situ- the kind of question that, that's confronting us. Here I'm at Watergate. I want to explain Watergate as a Yankee cowboy power struggle. In this line, another episode among the other episodes. Uh, but I think that I shouldn't talk a lot longer in monologue. I want in, uh, <coughs> in 1970, Nixon went to the CIA, uh, to Helms, and he said, we think that the new left, or the anti-war people and the civil rights people, are uh, subversives. We think that they are linked to foreign powers that they are uh, getting money and advice probably from Cubans and North Vietnamese and and that they ought to be declared outlaw and and, uh, we ought to clamp down on that thing. Besides, there's been a lot of violence and bombings and the weatherman thing is happening and so on. So Nixon goes to to the CIA and he says, will you not agree with the FBI that the new left is a nuisance, a taint, a burden, and we should get rid of it because it comes from outside? It's It's a really dupes of a foreign power. The CIA apparently studied the matter. In in May of 1973, uh, while the Watergate hearings were just getting in good process, Seymour Hersh, who lately startled everybody by putting a new lead on the same story, told us that uh, the CIA had received Nixon's request and had told him in a couple of 200-page reports that there was nothing to the story, that the New Left didn't have those kinds of ties to Cuba or North Vietnam or anybody else, and that there was no justification for an explicit and thoroughgoing federal clampdown on uh, anti-war and civil rights activity. Now, the reason I say that Hearst just wrote that story again when he came with a new lead just now, a few few days or weeks ago, is that you couldn't read that story the 1973 story at all carefully or curiously without realizing that if the CIA was able to say to Nixon that the New Left was clean, then perforce the CIA had to be doing intelligence activity within the New Left. That incidentally, not so incidentally, may be that part of the the part of the CIA that's being attacked now by these uh, new rounds of disclosures. When we come in on the CIA, a parenthesis, a parenthesis, we now have to be very careful about our resolutions. In other words, when we were resolving the CIA from a long way off, it was just clandestinism, our word for spookiness and bad things happening to our government. We got a little bit closer. We saw that the CIA stood politically off in discernible respects as over, over against the defense intelligence agency or the IRS spooks or the, or the narcs uh, or the FBI, certainly, or a variety of other intelligence uh, activities functioning in this clandestine sphere. We could tell the CIA, or at least we thought we could, apart from the others. Then we move a little bit closer, resolving on the CIA, and we start trying to get a sense of its internal structure. And I think that what we're beginning to find out, what we're beginning to see, is that the internal structure of the CIA, in some distorted fashion, with the proportions all wrong, reflects the basic divisions in the country the divisions that I stereotype and generalize as Yankee and cowboy. 
There is in particular a cowboy side of the CIA, the operations half of it, which uh, the, the, the operations, that is, the operations side of the CIA is, is, is typically linked to uh, right-wing ideologies, to the Howard Hunt and that whole Bay of Pigs clan is a part of that operations part of the CIA. These are the James Bond types, the ones who go through Hunt's uh, 20-some spy thrillers. Um, Empty-minded male chauvinist pigs, a lot of them, the heroes of that world. Then over against that, there's that other kind of empty-mindedness with a more subtle kind of chauvinism, tweedy, pipe-smoking, intellectual, learned, uh, attuned to events of culture, uh, understanding the world and controlling it through that understanding. The, the intelligence expert, the ones who, who look at all the inputs coming through all of the, uh, the avenues of intelligence gathering to the central place where it's all looked at and by people who know everything about what's happening. That's the intelligence side. Now, when Nixon wanted Helms to support his view that the new left should be wiped out because they were all foreign power supplied, it was the intelligence half of the CIA, the, the Estimates and National Assessments Group, that produced these 200-page reports that evidently carried out the intelligence on the new left and that argued with Nixon within the National Security Council with sufficient strength that it was evidently not possible for him to do what he wanted to do. And it would appear that as a direct result of that, he decided that he would find new means of doing what he wanted to do even if that would mean developing his own CIA. The beginnings of the White House's own little CIA are seen in the formation of the plumbers. The 10th anniversary of the, of the Bay of Pigs, Howard Hunt met Eugenio Martinez at the Bay of Pigs Monument in Miami, Florida. And that's when, the, when, when this whole thing started to unroll. As a direct result of a conflict within the administration, within the presidency, over the question, is the left to be suffered or is it to be wiped out? Why Nixon wanted to wipe out the left, why he wanted a mandate from the National Security Council to do this, I think we have to speculate about at a still further degree of speculation. Some people like Fletcher Prouty are making, at least privately, the argument that the Nixon people were prepared to believe that there was no alternative short of war and that uh, uh, it would just have to be got on with and people who couldn't stand it would have to be taken care of for the period in which it would be happening. It may have been in order to bring his secret war out of the closet and show us to it all, to show it to us that he was preparing to lock up those who would get squeamish or who would tend to protest about it or who were tapped into the kinds of organizations that could actually move and change the political uh, situation. In any case, he didn't get what he wanted the way he <laughs> wanted to get it, so he started trying to get it some other way. And that gave rise to the White House plumbers, which gave rise in itself to a certain alarm in the, in the CIA. I would think in the Helms intelligence part of the CIA, but I'm not trying to characterize Helms as a, as a hero of the new left. In fact, uh, this, this is one of, another one of those places where an attempt at a novel exposition begins to look like a, a piece of special pleading. I'm not, I don't... I'm not a part of anything that these people are about. Their elitism just seems to me the big thing that's wrong with them, and there's nothing good after that that's good enough to make up for it. The elitism just wipes them out. There's no talk of coordinating one's activities with a Yankee or with the intelligence side of the CIA. Not at all. But there is, rather, a, an attempt to understand the conflicts that divide them, because through these conflicts, sometimes the veils are torn, and we can see through... We can see through the illusions. We can see into the heart of darkness, Nixon's darkness. We can see what's really happening. So we study these conflicts because we need to know exactly what are the dynamics operating within a government in some large way. That tells us something about what opportunities ordinary, have, ordinary people have for seizing the initiative and, and defining the issues in their own way. At the moment, we can say, a plague on all these houses. It's clandestinism itself that we're out to, to rid this country's politics of, of liberal or conservative persuasion, all of it, because it's all of it bad, all of it against the Constitution, all of it against the democracy, all of it against the republic, and it all has to go. But at this particular moment, 
it would be, I think, wrong to be charmed by the uh, purity of one's commitments into uh, blindness about the fights that are actually taking place at the centers of power. And this particular fight between apparently some liberals who were afraid of what Nixon was about to do and Nixon who was about to do it centers right in on issues that are in the headlines today and that underlie Watergate. The formation of the plumbers arises from Nixon's attempt to establish a uniform policy on a key question without having a consensus to support it. That is to say, he's doing what Kennedy was doing. He's gone too far at the time of Watergate. He's creating the mechanisms of uh, domestic repression that cannot be accepted by his foes, even if they are not immediately aimed against his foes, but rather are aimed against the, the, the dissenters, the movement, because his foes, being foxy, uh, worldly wise people, understand very well enough that the instruments of torture invented to service one need can as well be used to service another, no, and the people who fall in the, in, into the role of bystander one day, tomorrow, can be participant victim. The secret police force that Nixon could establish, he could use for whatever he wanted to use, not just to get the left. Witness the, the Howard Hughes adventure that the plumbers almost had, an, an enticing episode that I think we should probably not linger on. Uh, but there's that, that whole, the Howard Hughes thing, we really do need to talk about the Howard Hughes thing. Let me try the Hughes thing. Let me try to talk about the November 1970 coup in the Howard Hughes empire. Another main source of Watergate, uh, right? <clears throat> better than in others, although lots of others are possible. You could talk about the wreck, wreck of the Penn Central as another paradigmatic moment in the in the struggles of Yankee and Cowboy. Hughes and Rockefeller are interesting, especially because in extra sharp and vivid ways they embody these forces of monopoly versus uh, modern entrepreneurialism, uh, which I've been trying to describe. The Hughes story, I'll, I'll never begin to do this right because it's very broad and, and novelistic and interesting. I just want to try to get a few of the essentials so that the curve of it will seem right. Hughes, in the, in the 20s and the 30s, in the early part of this country's uh, industri this, this century's industrialization, understands with the power of, of, uh, of a prophet sometimes, the indications of, uh, of industrial development over the next decade, sees in particular the importance of transoceanic communications, and among many other projects, gets involved in the effort to build the 747, in effect. It's too early. He doesn't have the metallurgy. He doesn't have the engines. And people laugh at it and call it the spruce goose. But Hughes knew that there were going to have to be such things. Partly he knew that because he saw America emerging as a world empire and knew that we were going to be confronted on all sides with problems that we would have to take care of by sending troops all over the place. We only had a few troops because we were as a population, smaller than the other people in the world. There were only a few hundred million of us, there were 200 million of us, there were billions of the others. So Hughes figured you had to find some way to technologically multiply the power of the few Americans so that they could endure in their struggle against the others, the whites, really, in their struggle against the others. That's why he started trying to build a spruce goose, that huge plywood uh, airplane that once in 1947, I think, he got it 100 feet, 100 feet off the water, a seaplane. Uh, well, the, the reason it gets of more than usual importance in the story of Yankee and Cowboy, this airplane, is that at a certain point, Senator Owen Brewster of Maine in 1947 uh, brought it out that Hughes, along with a lot of other people, had, uh, had profited enormously from wartime contracts, including the contracts to build the, uh, the spruce goose, and, uh, and he started harassing Hughes about this, throwing around all kinds of figures about how much money Hughes had ripped the country off for by building these airplanes that never did get to war. They weren't finished even by the time the war was over. Even years after the war, the Spruce Goose, which was, I think, supposed to be a wartime airplane, was still not even really up to prototype uh, levels. That had happened to a lot of other people, and Hughes wasn't alone, but he was vulnerable. And Senator Brewster... Uh, started attacking him publicly for it, and finally was able to bring him before uh, a Senate investigating committee with a lot of reporters and a lot of lights turned on. Uh, Hughes didn't want to go. 
He has never wanted to be in public about anything. Well, during that period, he was a kind of a public man. But this begins the time when he sours against public appearances. He comes into, into Brewster's uh, Senate hearing room, and he hears the charges against him. And he says, well, what's really behind this, and he's saying this to a national audience, if there had been TV, it would have been going then. He says, what Brewster is really doing is trying to coerce me into throwing TWA into a into a, a relationship with the Rockefeller powers that they have been trying to get me to join in with for a long time. And the only thing it means is that they're trying to get this air, airline away from me, the TWA airline. And Brewster would not be calling me, he says, into this thing today if it weren't for that. Because two weeks ago, Brewster came to me and he said, these hearings don't have to take place if you will just go along with the Juan Trippi plan on TWA. Now, what was that? In war, at the end of World War II, the Yankee custodians of the European Reconstruction made a basic decision that the airlines of the European countries would be cartelized. That is to say, each country would, would have one overseas airline, not internally, the overseas airline. And they wanted to form an American counterpart, on the, the Yankees did, on the theory, probably silly, that uh, that was the only way they could compete with the foreigners. And to get the whole thing put together, they wanted Hughes TWA to be assimilated with Pan American and, and the other overseas carrier, if there was one. There may have been just that one. Hughes saw it for what it was, an outright attempt on the part of the Rockefellers to get a monopoly control over uh, uh, international airways. And Hughes felt there was no reason why that should happen since he had been the inventor of the ideas of international, the idea of international airways to begin with. So when he pointed this out in public to Brewster, the result was that Brewster collapsed, that he couldn't even run for the Senate again next time. Uh, there were Hughes for president uh, committees that sprung up every place, and, and he was presented in his sloppy slouch hat and his, uh, in his long, lanky frame, no tie, uh, as, as a sort of a popular figure. Four billion dollars worth of popular, but <laughs> <laughs> images can, do a, can hide a lot. Uh, well, that beat back the Yankee Rockefeller attempt to assimilate Hughes Holdings into the Yankee, uh, highly rationalized Yankee monopoly empire. But by the time of the Jets in the, in the 50s and then into the 60s, the whole fight was to break out again in a much more complicated and earnest way involving massive and uh, lengthy uh, uh, court altercations that is really impossible for me to go into because it's just too complicated to do uh, impromptu. But the, the upshot of it was that a concert of Yankee bankers wanted TWA, and, and TWA got, it, got vulnerable because of the coming of the jets. Hughes could have bought the jets and the new facilities he needed to maintain them out of the pocket of Hughes Tool Company. But Hughes Tool Company was operating with Hughes Aircraft in some way, and the antitrust regulations made it illegal for somebody operating in one sphere of the aviation industry, like in production or manufacture, to operate in another, like flying airplanes around, like the airlines. So Hughes was not able to take his own Hughes entrepreneured money out of one pocket and put it in the other pocket because of the laws that the Rockefeller types had written. The Rockefeller types had written the laws conforming to the needs of monopoly capitalists, not to the needs of entrepreneurs. So what followed out of this was an enormous long fight that was resolved, I suppose, in, uh, let's see, when is it? In 1966, I'm certainly not able to remember the year, when Hughes got pushed out of his airline, uh, forced to sell it off, and uh, found himself that much nakeder than he had been. Of course, he had a lot of money. I think some enormous check was written for his shares of TWA. $486 million comes to my mind. And it's at that point that Hughes, it seems to me from looking at the record, that Hughes says to himself, how am I going to continue this fight against the Rockefellers beyond this round in which I have been beaten out of my airline? How can I reconstitute? How can I reorganize? How can I get it going again? Can I build up another industrial empire? He comes to Boston to think it through. It's 1966. It was quite a scene. It lasted a few months. Uh, all our brave reporter types were banging at the doors and going through the walls with fire hatchets trying to get a picture of the elusive Hughes. Uh, they weren't able to do it 
But he gradually, um, at the center of this chaos, which constantly swirls around him as he becomes a more and more secretive person, he makes the decision that he can't rebuild his industrial empire. He can't start from the beginning again with a technology as with the oil stuff or the airplane. He has to start with something that's already there. He has to buy an empire already essentially built. And he decides that the empire he wants is Meyer Lansky's. And he sits in Boston debating, is he going to go to the Bahamas with his $486 million or is he going to go to Las Vegas? He thought for a while, says Robert Mayhew, his main officer in the campaign to create a new empire. He thought first of going to the Bahamas, then for whatever reason decided against it, went to Las Vegas in November uh, 1966. Uh, set himself up in a, in a casino inn that his man, Robert Mayhew, had uh, bought the night before from uh, the, the syndicate and, uh, and proceeded through Mayhew to establish in Las Vegas a situation in which he had neutralized the ordinary hostility that the syndicate might feel against a newcomer and new competition was able to convince Lansky and some of the others that he was good for Las Vegas because he legitimated that kind of business. He brought a new glamour to it, brought new people to town. And he proceeded for a, for a period of four years through Mayhew up through 19, November 1972 to build up on the base of this gradually acquired casino and hotel uh, uh, industry a political empire that linked him into all the important politicians of the region and a lot of others besides, and uh, one of them was Dick Nixon. Uh, exactly the form of Hughes' relationship to Nixon as it began to shape up during the Las Vegas period has to be understood in terms of the fact that Nixon was Lansky's man. When Hughes was trying to buy Nixon, he was buying somebody who had already been bought. And that is why that Rebozo money is so touchy, the $100,000 that was delivered from Hughes people to, to, to Rebozo during what year? When was that? 1969-70, the end of 69-70. They were, Nixon was trying to, to take money that Lansky wouldn't skim, it seems. Lansky, Lansky was giving, or Hughes was giving some money that Lansky wouldn't know about. The reason they had so much trouble with it, the reason Rebozo couldn't hide it, was that he couldn't use any of the ordinary hiding places, which all belonged to the Lansky system. That, that money couldn't be entered into that laundry. Otherwise, it would be discovered by the people that Nixon and Hughes were trying to apparently keep it secret from. That's a, a way out speculation on my part, but I tell you, looking at all the evidence, I can't figure out why else they are so touchy about their Rebozo money when 150000 other dollars goes very freely to Nixon during that time from in, in the overland route. It's that underhanded money that's buying special dark time privileges that created all the, the, uh, the curiosity and the fuss. Anyway, uh, what, I guess the question is, what must Lansky's relationship to Hughes have been in view of the fact then that not only was Hughes busy, in effect, moving Lansky out of control of Las Vegas, taking over, and at the same time, uh, buying favors from Lansky's uh, chief political figure. When, now, now here is the kind of place where I, I'm just sort of at a loss. I've written a, a book. I'm trying to write an analysis of this because the reason it's so hard in a situation like this to get this to seem at all credible is just it's so goofy. But when you, when you actually bury yourself in the materials and try to figure out why these people were doing the things they were doing, then reconstructions like the following begin to make sense. It seems that while Hughes was ripping Lansky people off by taking over Las Vegas and buying into the Nixon Corporation, Lansky at, that, at the same time, through a man by the name of John Meyer, had attached himself up under to the Hughes apparatus and was operating a million do a ripoff around fraudulent silver mines and worthless land claims that netted the Lansky people some $10 million over the four years that Hughes was in town. So that, even though that Lansky could see in certain respects that he w was losing ground, he also, you might say, had compensation for it that Hughes didn't know about. Later, in 1970, 
suddenly there was a big fight between the Hughes people in Las Vegas who were handling this whole burgeoning empire, Robert Mayhew was the key guy, and the people on Hughes Tool Company, uh, headquartered in Los Angeles. That's the main part of the Hughes empire. Now, the people at Tool Co., led by Chester Davis, uh, thought that uh, Mayhew was getting too much influence and was too close to Hughes. And in a very complicated and very wild uh, event that takes place on Thanksgiving Eve in Las Vegas in 1970, a whole lot of weird types, Chester Davis, the Tool Co. Board of Directors, uh, secret police forces like Intertel and others converge on the Mayhew Citadel in Las Vegas, and the next thing Mayhew knows, he's out. Tool Co. people have asserted their control over the Hughes Nevada operations, and from that time on, Mayhew is looking for a job. It's at that point, in the middle of the night, that Hughes mysteriously disappears from his penthouse uh, command suite uh, at the Desert Inn and presumably goes, or is, sa is said to go, uh, to the Britannia Beach Hotel in the Bahamas, a hotel which we know was controlled completely by syndicate interests. As Mayhew said, why, if Hughes suddenly was going to leave town, suddenly, without saying a word of it to me, his intimate telephone companion at least for four years, why would he go... That's because nobody saw Hughes, except a handful of the Mormon mafia, so-called. The Mormons figure in this, too, but please, that is a whole other can of stuff. May you raise a simple question. Why would Hughes fly to the citadel of his enemy uh, four and more years if, if he had to escape from me? Why, why, wouldn't he, why would he do that? Well, it seems that if Hughes actually did that, and he's not, like May Brussels says, already dead and is nothing but a disembodied voice, a, a legal fiction being maintained for reasons of the empire, the Hughes empire, is a total possibility. But uh, he does live. Still, it's true that he has apparently no contact with the real world except these Mormon nurse secretaries who are the only ones who ever see him in person. And what would he know of the world except what they told him? Well, they told him that he was getting ripped off. They said there are all these uh, swindles around uh, worthless security claims and land deals, and you've lost $10 million. And it was all true. They showed him the records. They only changed one detail. Instead of saying that Johnny Meyer did it all, Lansky's guy, as it turns out, they said that Robert Mayhew did it all. Mayhew, who had been close to Hughes, and Hughes believed him. Uh, maybe because there were so many influential people telling him. Stephen Golden, for example, a real close guy to Richard Nixon from a long time back, a Secret uh, Service guy who had got close to Nixon in, 19, uh, in the 1950s when Nixon was VP, who had then come back into the Nixon thing and who was Nixon's man in the Bahamas. Steve Golden was in that little expedition party that took Hughes away from uh, Las Vegas and reinstalled him at the center of uh, Lansky's power base in the Bahamas. A power base that, by the way, to link up one strand, had been created as a direct result of the loss of the Cuban base. Um, where we are with... Uh, with Hughes at the moment is a, is a direct result of uh, the next step in, that Mayhew took uh, when he saw what was happening. He realized, I guess, soon that he would have little chance of enduring against those kinds of forces uh, who had the march on him anyway. But what he uh, could do was prepare to secure himself a, a little safety zone. I've mentioned that uh, Hughes and uh, Mayhew never saw each other in all the time they, they worked together. And, and Mayhew goes way back. Mayhew had, a, had some, played a role in the organizing of an assassination, a number of assassination attempts on Castro in connection with the CIA, by the way. <laughs> well, Mayhew, as the whole thing is happening, oh no, I'm still telling you about, uh, <laughs> there, since there is no face-to-face -face contact over all those years, uh, there is a large record of recorded telephone conversations and a large uh, collection of memos in Hughes' handwriting, which were the main instruments through which Hughes would give 
instructions to Mayhew, legal, yellow legal uh, pads, thousands of them, scribbled these notes, scribbled one after the other, do this, do that, point four, point 90. It's how they communicated. Well, these things had been stored in some kind of place, and when Hughes, Mayhew saw that he was about to get removed, he did what you and I would do. He got as many of these documents uh, bearing on all aspects of his relationship to Hughes, on all the various themes that he had undertaken to elaborate for Hughes, and he stashed them. He stashed them in the safe of the Las Vegas Sun, whose editor, Hank Greenspun, is a, is a close friend of Robert Mayhew's. On the basis of these secret uh, Hughes to Mayhew uh, memoranda and uh, phone tapes, Mayhew was evidently able to pose the possibility of disclosure, of scandal, such that he at least had some bargaining power in the tumult of Las Vegas and couldn't be entirely blown away. In any case, a little bit later in the offices of the Robert Mullen Company, a phony PR firm actually working in some relationship to some part of the CIA and some part of the Nixon group, uh, there is a meeting convened with uh, Howard Hunt and uh, a guy named Ralph Winnie, who is a security man for the tool co side of the Hughes interest, uh, a few other people. They talk about what Mayhew has, and they talk about ways to get it away from him. That aborted mission involving Liddy and Hunt and who else in which Howard Hughes was supposed to supply a getaway plane and a, and a safe hideaway in a Central American Republic, that mission to Las Vegas to get some papers of an undisclosed nature apparently was, an, uh, was a mission designed to recover the Mayhew documents, the Mayhew documents which, had, which, shed, which sent, shed some light on the relationship between Nixon and Hughes or Nixon and other people that Hughes happened to know about that the Hughes, vast Hughes intelligence system might have picked up. That, uh, that these people wanted to keep out of, out of light, that the Nixon people wanted to keep suppressed. And it seems that, the, that that may have been one of the very first operations of the plumbers, trying to get the Mayhew stash out of Las Vegas, out of Mayhew's hands. Uh, they weren't successful. They weren't even able to begin the operation, apparently. In any case, the Mayhew stash remains basically intact. It was the basis of, of a Mayhew uh, libel suit against Hughes, which just at the beginning of, uh, well, it was, it was maybe the beginning of last year, I think um, Mayhew won. He just got a judgment of a huge amount of money. Does somebody know it? $175 million. Hughes had called him a dishonest, lying son of a bitch. He stole me blind. And he said it in a telephone interview that arose over the Clifford Irving controversy, which, believe it or not, also seems to be involved in all this stuff. <laughs> because the, what Clifford Irving is about seems to be the power struggle. He's, what he does, that this book that he tried to write, that he did a, a great job of writing, is conceived in the immediate aftermath of the Thanksgiving coup in the Hughes Empire, November 1970. Well, in a, in a telephone interview arising out of the Irving controversy, the voice of Hughes is heard to say, Mayhew is a dishonest, lying son of a bitch. He stole me blind. Now, what Hughes is thinking about when he says that is what Johnny Meyer had done to him, which he thought Mayhew had done. Well, Mayhew said that that is libelous. I didn't do anything like what he said, and I'm going to take it to court. He did. These documents were the uh, main basis of his case. He won it, and he was just given a very big uh, uh, settlement. Where that stands now, who knows? Who, who will go back and pick up the pieces and begin to put the story together again? Whatever was the relationship between Hughes and Nixon, it was something that the Nixon people were dramatically afraid of. There is even that argument that the whole Watergate expedition arises in the first place because of Nixon's feeling that he had to know what the Democrats might have learned about Nixon and Hughes through Larry O'Brien's relationship with Robert Mayhew, which developed in the immediate aftermath of the shooting of Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy had not been dead before, uh, had not been dead two weeks before one of Hughes' memos to Mayhew says, make contact with the Kennedy organization. Tell them not to do anything until they hear from me. Let me make a first offer. O'Brien at least was interested. Several others appeared to have come over to Hughes and to have done some kind of work linked into the Mayhew side of the organization before the coup. Now, what could O'Brien have learned about Nixon and Hughes in, the, in that relationship? That seems to have been the fear gnawing at the vitals of creep when it decides to send its best and brightest to find out what is being said over those telephones. Uh, 
They, they think of going to Las Vegas. They organize to think of going to Las Vegas to get the Mayhew papers. They go into the DNC to find out about Hughes, what the Democrats knew. In the back of their minds certainly was the scandal about Hughes and Nixon that came out just at the 11th hour in the 1960 campaign, where, where it turned out that, uh, well, it was a scandal that Im implicated the two of them together. And a lot of people say that the few votes that it cost Hughes co or cost Nixon led to his losing the election. So maybe the Nixon people had uh, a feeling they were about to see the same thing. Once again, a Hughes scandal was going to break on the eve of a triumph and uh, 1972 would turn out to be 1960 all over again. And they didn't want it to happen, and they were afraid that it would. Why? Because of something having to do with a Hughes-Nixon relationship. We can imagine that it goes to the heart of the conflict within and around the Hughes empire in November 1970. We can imagine that, uh, that it links in uh, such facts as uh, Mayhew's previous role operating with the CIA in attempts to coordinate with the Mafia, John Roselli of the Syndicate, uh, assassination attempts on the life of Castro. Um, how it all comes together at the end is, uh, I guess, as simple, it seems to me, as the other stuff is complicated. It's just that the forces operating in this country, uh, stimulated by the... Uh, larger world circumstances that have uh, developed over the past 40, 30, wow. maybe 50 years have produced an atmosphere and a technological capability for clandestine operations that has uh, grown and grown and grown and grown. The perception that this is with us, though, uh, is not altogether new, and I mean to say that even though we are, we may feel that we are the first ones to understand how deep clandestinism has gone with us, may, maybe we tend to think that we are the first ones to see that things like conspiracy assassination cabals really do come together and really do bump off presidents and really do get away with it and come back to get away with some more. We may think that we're the first to see that, but, you know, it's not true. And, and as we come to developing this kind of consciousness, the state to which our self-government has fallen, uh, I think it may be some reassurance to us that uh, our forefathers, the bicentennial types, were into the same trip. <laughs> you know this book by Bernard Balin, The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution. It's a great little book. I'm going to do something with it that Balin probably wouldn't like, but I'll just read a, a few things just to close, just to give you a sense of how things come back and come back and come back again and again. The theory of politics, he opens up his chapter three, Power and Liberty, a Theory of Politics. Uh, the ideological origins of the American Revolution. The theory of politics that emerges from the political literature of the pre-revolutionary year, 1775, our year, <clears throat> 200 years ago. The theory of politics that emerges from the political literature of the pre-revolutionary year rests on the belief that what lay behind every political scene the ultimate explanation of every political controversy was the disposition of power. That already makes us contemporary with Jefferson, <laughs> because that's what we're trying to talk about, the disposition of power. It's not really conspiracy theory. It's a thousand times not paranoia. It's the decision to try to study power as it is, to see how it configures itself, how the coalitions come and go, what makes them tick, what makes them fall apart. The acuteness of the colonist sense of this problem is for the 20th century reader one of the most striking things to be found in this 18th century literature. It serves to link the revolution, revolutionary generation to our own in the most intimate way. A little further, most commonly, Balin, still, Balin says, the discussion of power in the pre-revolutionary period, just before we started getting it on, us kind of people 200 years ago, most commonly the discussion of power centered on its essential characteristic of aggressiveness, its endlessly propulsive tendency to expand itself beyond legitimate boundaries. In expressing this central thought, which explained more of politics past and present to them than any other single consideration, the writers of the time outdid themselves in verbal ingenuity. All sorts of metaphors, similes, and analogies were nothing as good as creep, were used to express this view of power. 
the image most commonly used was that of the act of trespassing. Power, it was said over and over again, has an encroaching nature. If it, and, and these are quoted phrases from a variety of, of colonial writings. If at first it meets with no control, it creeps by degrees and quick subdues the whole. Sometime the images of the human hand, <clears throat> the hand of power, reaching out to clutch and to seize. Power is grasping and tenacious in its nature. What it seizes, it will retain. Sometimes power is like the ocean, not easily admitting limits to be fixed in it. Sometimes it is, quote, like a cancer, like a cancer on the president's. It eats faster and faster every hour. And now just one more little bit, because this will give us a little sense of, of how they talked about it, the colonists. Careful analysts like Jefferson agreed on the major point in one of the most closely reasoned of the pamphlets of 1775, 1774, Jefferson stated unambiguously that though, quote, single acts of tyranny may be ascribed to the accidental opinion of a day, a series of oppressions begun at a distinguished period and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers too plainly prove a deliberate and systematical plan of reducing us to slavery. I couldn't imagine a better summary. How about give me about a minute to uh, <clears throat> drink a little water and, and let people who want out, because I've gone so long, get out. And